It's great to have you here for another live Action for Happiness event. My name is Mark Williamson and thank you so much for being here. Um, today's event is called Happier Thinking and I'm absolutely delighted that we're joined today by the fantastic Mo Godat, who's a, a great friend and supporter of this mission that we're all on together to create a happier and kinder world. Uh, Mo, thank you for being here. And uh, I know you've just come back from uh, traveling. So we're so grateful that you've made time to, for this today. It's always, always a pleasure, Mark. I mean, uh, you always uh, ask the best questions. We always have the best conversations. Uh, most people should know that the only reason that anyone listens to anything I say is that when I published my first book, I met you around two weeks later and you encouraged me to to continue and to push forward. And so you definitely, definitely have made a mega difference for me. Thank you always oh, for supporting that's, that's me. So kind of you to say, well, you've made a mega difference for so many people here. I'm sure uh, many uh, in this community here are already very familiar with your work. But we will have a chance to revisit some of the, the journey that you've been on as part of this conversation. But just first of all, thank you uh, to anyone who's joining for the first time today. A very warm welcome. This is a kind, friendly, supportive community. Please do engage in the chat and we'll be keeping it kind and relevant as always. There's a Q&A function if you'd like to ask a question to Mo and we'll come to those a bit later in the conversation. So everyone here who's a regular, thank you for being part of this amazing community and for all that you do to support it. Um, today's topic, Mo, is happier thinking and um, we're going to talk a lot about a book, you, one of your many books, but one about uh, the little voice in your head, as you called it. Um, but before we do that, I... I I wanted to revisit the journey that you've been on, really, and that amazing book that you know was was reached so many people. Solve for Happy. You were, of course, a, the big guy at Google X, the innovation arm of Google, and life circumstances led you to become particularly focused on happiness. I'd love it if you could maybe just retell a little bit of that journey in whatever way seems most appropriate to you. Yeah. First of all, thank you for everyone who's uh, who's here. If if you know my work, you may have heard this before. But I uh, I lived two full lives, uh, Mark, as you know. Uh, one is I was a tech executive for many many years. I uh, I really was blessed, as my daughter always says. I was paid in advance uh, by reaching really the height of the tech career. I was chief business officer of Google X. Uh, and, uh, you know, in technology, this is the innovation arm of, of Google, uh, you know, you don't get better than that. And uh, uh, somehow I was completely miserable. Uh, I mean, for many, many years throughout my career, having made everything uh, that everyone dreams of, that, you know, this dream that they sell to you, I was completely unhappy. And, uh, you know, it's quite interesting because now I'm quite the opposite. I have very few things in my life. I have a very minim minimalist lifestyle. I give most of my money away and I am the happiest I've ever been. Uh, the, the turning point happened uh, in two stages. One uh, was uh, my, my lovely daughter uh, when she was five and I was uh, the grumpiest dad alive. I remember vividly one uh, one time when I really broke her heart with my unhappiness and my stressful lifestyle. And, you know, that drove me to try and search for happiness in a way that uh, I couldn't understand the typical conversation around happiness, you know, the gurus and the teachers and the and the sages and the practice. And I couldn't, I just couldn't grasp it because my engineer's mind is highly mathematical. And so I attempted to understand happiness uh, through uh, my logical brain, which was uh, really not a bad idea, but it wasn't easy to grasp with your brain only. So I had this tiny little monk in my life, my son Ali, and Ali was always my heart, if you want. So I would, I would analyze things with my head and I would go to him and ask him, Ali, I discovered this and that. And he would say, oh, Papa, that means this. That's you know, that's the way hearts feel those things. And together, Ali and I, we developed a model and the model worked really well for me and for him and for everyone in our family and friends. And and sadly, my second life started when he left our world. So Ali was 21 and a half at the time. He was the pride of any father. Uh, and he uh, went for a very simple surgical operation that went wrong uh, five times, sadly, five mistakes in a row. And he left our world in four hours. So between hugging him, 
you know, so it was a very simple, it's an appendix inflammation. So we didn't even worry that anything would go wrong. This is, you know, there are millions of people that do that every year. But then four hours later, he left our world. And and somehow the drive I had when he did, left us was not to close. I mean, of course, I felt tremendous pain, but I, I wasn't going to just close my door and cry for the rest of my life. I was more going to share what he taught me with the world because I wanted a tiny bit of his essence to to remain if you want. So I started a mission that at the time was 10 million happy, became 1 billion happy after. And I wrote a book called Soul for Happy. And Soul for Happy was a very unusual approach to the topic. It was a highly modernized, logical, mathematical, almost very simple math, but mathematical approach to why happiness works, how it works. And a lot of people were waiting for that, I think. So uh, it became an international bestseller. And here I am. Mm. Well, Mo, firstly, um, I know you've told that story many times and it's touched many people, but just again, hearing that, I'm very moved and I'm so sorry that that is something you went through. I'm a father of teenagers now and I can, can't can imagine what that must be like to lose someone um, so precious. Um, and thank you for what you've done since in response to that and how you've um, become an inspiration and I wondered if before we move on maybe you could just remind us I, there was there was this very powerful message or equation even in that soul for happy book about this sort of way of thinking about happiness do you want to just remind us about that because I found it really helpful yeah I mean I, I mean I, I I would expand a tiny bit even not just the equation I think there are three misunderstandings and the understandings about happiness one of them is the mechanics of it which is described by the equation but the other two are the you know the fact that we're all born happy right so so most people forget that i think the modern world uh rem it somehow tries to convince us that happiness is something you acquire something that you purchase you know you you dress in a certain way and so people say oh how pretty and then you become happy or you buy something and you know hold it in your hand and feel proud and then you become happy or whatever things from outside you which is not true at all because every child you've ever seen when they're fed and safe and given their basic needs of survival, they're happy. So happiness is almost our innate state, right? And, and when you think about it this way, it completely changes the solution because you don't, you no longer seek happiness. Uh, you, you seek to stop unhappiness, which is the second assumption. So the second assumption basically is, is that uh, unhappiness is the default and you're, you know, you're trying to uh, drown it with things that the truth of it is that happiness is the absence of unhappiness. Okay. That if you remove the reasons you're unhappy from your life, what, what remains behind is a happy default child that is actually, you know, uh, okay with life as it is. And, and, and the third is that, uh, you know, people think that happiness is very erratic, that, you know, life throws things your way and then you become happy. Life takes them away. You become unhappy. And my work on on, on Soul for Happy was ba ba mainly based on an equation that said happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and your expectations of how life should be. Okay. And basically this is, it's not, you can, you can easily notice this because no single event has the power to, to make every human happy but can, I just, can I just re, re, refresh that so it's the it's the, the what's the difference actually going on compared to what your ex, what, what you would what you want to want go on. to see happening is yeah that exactly is so point? so you know if if it rains and you want you want to water your plant you're happy right if it's rain if it rains and you want to sit in the sun you're unhappy it, it rain itself has no inherent value of happiness mm. now when you when you see it that way, suddenly a few definitions pop up, right? Uh, very important definitions because happiness then doesn't become what we think it is. Happiness in that case is events meeting or beating expectations, right? And when events meet or beat expectations, you get a very different feeling than what you get if you're on, in a party jumping up and down. You get a feeling of calm and peaceful contentment. You look at life around you. And you say, life as it is, is what I want or expect life to be, okay? And then you feel okay with that. You feel that you don't want life to move on from that moment, even though, you know, your neighbor may, might have something more than you, but you're okay with life as it is, okay? 
<clears throat> that definition is very different than the party. The party is dopamine driven. It's a reward excitatory that basically tells you enjoy life. Nothing wrong with enjoying life, but it's different than happiness. It's different than ca that calm and peaceful contentment, which in our bodies is actually serotonin driven, a different hormone. Okay. And, and serotonin is a calmer. It basically describes exactly what the happiness equation says. It, it means that you're, you've scanned the world around you. You feel that it's safe and appropriate and optimum for your survival and success. And so you calm down. You do what, what is actually more important than our cortisol stress res survival response. More important for your survival is to get that calm and peaceful feeling. So you can digest your food, you can do your liver functions, your kidney functions, your, you know, you can uh, rest your, you know, your mind and reflect and so on and so forth, which are very important for our survival. So, mm -hmm. so when people mix up ser serotonin, calm and peaceful, contented happiness with dopamine, excited, reward-driven happiness, we feel empty inside. We end up with a, a, a constant strive for that fun, excitement, acquiring, buying new things, you know, being in new experiences, when in reality, surprisingly, I don't know if, if, you, if you feel the same, I'm sure you do, but most of my monk friends, for example, will be extremely happy with life with nothing at all because they don't need that reward hit. And, and I always think about when, when, uh, when COVID hit us, okay? A lot of people at the beginning really struggled because there was do that dopamine withdrawal. You couldn't, you couldn't find your calm and peace by just being with yourself because you were so used to that hits of parties and you know exercise and games and watching football and being with friends and just distracting your brain all the time. Uh, yeah. And so you're not or not able to find that calm and peace. The, I the, think most... the other thing that sorry, Mo, the, the other thing that that equation raises for me is the idea that um, we can't necessarily control the external events, but we we can potentially reframe hundred expectations. And I think you've just reminded me of that with that incredibly moving example of your beloved son Ali. And you know, suddenly hearing that, you know, every argument I might be having with my teenage daughter, all the day to exactly. day challenges, yeah. just like just melts away. It's like that's so exactly relevant in the grand scheme of things and life and loss and and exactly. But 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 what what you're doing in that case as well, uh, 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 Mark, is you're you're reframing both because most people think that happiness is only about okay, if I reduce my expectations, I will be happy. But what you're also reframing is is you're reframing the relationship with your child. You're, re re you're reframing the event itself because the event when your child is a little annoying every child sometimes is fussy and right when they are a little annoying you can tell yourself oh my god they're annoying uh, and that's your 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 observation of the event if you've had what i had in my life happen in front of you to a friend like we're friends so you know what happened to me now you reframe it in your brain and you say Oh, yes, they are fussy, but they're here and I can still hug them and they're happy and I love them and, and, mm -hmm. and, right? And you see all of those ands and the event itself is reshaped, okay? You still may not expect your children. You don't want, your expectation is that they're not fussy or your hope is that they're not. But now that you see the whole event, okay, suddenly events still beat expectation by a mile. Hmm? I always tell myself that about being stuck in traffic. Huh? A simple ex example that we all go through, but being stuck in traffic actually in itself means that you're in a vehicle, not walking in the sun like Africans do for 30 kilometers a day to go get water, that you're actually in a place that is, you know, a city. So you are probably going somewhere to do something that, and so on. You can think of all of those things. It's not that I'm just stuck in traffic. There is so much around it that when you frame the event properly, happiness becomes a lot easier. Yeah, I like thinking of traffic as a chance to just meditate and be- uh, Exactly, and yeah, absolutely. Time. I know you've just absolutely. been on a silent retreat and recognizing the benefit of stopping. Maybe maybe our traffic jams can be our little silent retreats. Absolutely, Mo, let's, you, let's you, you, were just, you were just, we were just talking yeah. before the, before we came about the flight, right? Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I love my flights because I stopped watching movies and distractions and so on. And, you know, my, this last flight was five hours and I sat in silence and I enjoyed my meditation and I reflected, I took some notes, right? It's a wonderful experience that when you do that, you start to tell yourself, why is it only five hours? 
You know, can it be eight hours because your Wi-Fi is off and you're away from the world? Wonderful in every possible way, mm -hmm. while others struggle with it if they frame it differently. Yeah. Mo, your your more recent book on happiness is called That Little Voice in Your Head. And I think one of the aspects around our happiness and these expectations and the difference between them is the way that we talk to ourselves. And I've been really surprised doing the work we've done with Ashley Happiness for 12 or more years now, how many people who are incredibly kind, generous, pro-social people are actually remarkably unkind to themselves in the way that we speak to ourselves, myself included at times. And so I wondered if before we hear some of your wisdom on this idea of the little voice, I wonder if we could involve the community here in some way. So um, perhaps we could ask a question to all of you here. What, what is it something that your little voice in your head might tell you? constructive or, or otherwise but what's what's the sort of thing that you often hear yourself saying to yourself in your head um if i did that i think it, i would have to remove some of the expletives actually um <laughs> because i can be quite rude to myself but i'm just going to read out some of the things people are sharing though and then i can hear your responses so i'm stupid i'm screwed up i'm a fool um be grateful you're too old you're unkind you're not doing anything worthwhile you're not good enough that seems to be quite a common one um oh, i can rest when i'm dead um oh. thing i should be doing more um people don't like me you're not enough speed up you're stupid lazy you should do more exercise you're worthless you are fake wow i mean this is oh wow these are some nasty inner voices we have here mo what's going on can i tell you what my voice tells me yeah oh my god i'm alive what a freaking gift like think about this think about this i mean so so what what ends up happening is that normally and i think it's a very important trick um your voice sounds like the one that was harshest to you as a child okay so if you actually listen to the tone listen to the exact words if you dig deep and you reflect you'll find very often that this is either your mother talking or your grandma telling you you're worth this or whatever that is, right? And it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, there is that what I call the vantage point. When, when those people, uh, of course, when we grow older in life, hmm, you know, even someone that I respect tremendously like you, Mark, if you tell me something and it really doesn't match my belief system, I'll be able to say, no, Mark, I don't think that's actually how I think about life. Hmm? When you're a child and, a, and an older or a bigger normally bigger is the topic, huh? a bigger person is talking to you in a specific way, it sounds almost like facts, like this is it. If if someone tells you you're never going to amount to anything, my lovely, lovely mother, I always joke with her about this, used to tell me if you don't score A pluses, you're going to end up being a garbage collector. OK, and, you know, that would be your career because nobody will take you to do anything else. And with all due respect to garbage collectors, by the way, I think it's a wonderful job, to be honest, uh, you know, but but at the end of the day, I I really feared that. And for a very long time, I believed that. And for a very long time, I really, really, really punished myself if I didn't get an A plus. Right. But you know what? Uh, I know quite a few college dropouts that are multi billionaires. Right. And, you know, the reality is my mother's statement was not correct at all. Now, the, the challenge we have is that this brain of ours, hmm, it, it, we, we're going to talk about the inputs where it comes, where it brings up all of those things in a minute. But the challenge with that brain is that whatever it tells us is taken for granted. Okay. And so most of us uh, think as per the, you know, uh, Descartes statement, I think therefore I am. OK, so so we glorify thought so much that we believe that whatever is being told inside our head is me talking to me, OK, is me telling me the right thing to do. Now, that statement, when you say it out loud, it's me talking to me actually sounds very stupid, because if it was me talking to me, why would it need to talk? Do you understand that? If it's a subject-object relationship, then the subject is different than the object. Otherwise, I would in, in, inherently, I would, I would in, instinctively know what my brain, what, what, what I want to tell to myself. So there is a ton of studies. MIT was very active in that. 2007, there was a study that I love very much about. They, they studied with MRIs, people as they solved problems. And they, they noticed that the brain 
uh, the you know the problem solving areas of the brain would actually engage in solving the problem and then after the answer is found the participants communication area the you know the the vo the, the 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 area of your brain that you use to speak out loud would actually fire up in the mri for up to 8 seconds before the participant knows the answer which basically means that the brain solves the problem first and takes up to 8 seconds to turn it into words so that you can hear it Okay, your brain is literally talking to you. Okay, so I think therefore I am is a mega mistake. It's I am therefore my brain thinks. And once you see that, I think that was the biggest turning point in my life. Anyone who hasn't read A New Earth or uh, The Power of Now by uh, Eckhart Tolle, one of the two is a mandatory reading. And, and in, my, in, my, in my experience, when I read uh, Eckhart Tolle calls, calls your thinking mind, he calls it the thinker basically, right? And, and when you separate the thinker from yourself, Mm -hmm. everything changes because most of those thoughts, if my brain tells me I'm a failure, I will, I will stop and say, prove it, okay? Tell me what do you think I, I have failed at and tell me, by the way, what you think I've succeeded at, okay? And by the way, tell me if I've tried my best because even if I failed and I've tried my best, that doesn't count as failure. And tell me if I've learned from my failures and I will have those conversations and I will have them literally with a third party. A lot of people who know my work will remember that I call my brain Becky. I treat, I treat my brain as a third party. And because it's a third party, I now have the, the, the right to disobey, okay? I have the right to debate what it tells me. I have a right to ask for proof and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and evidence. And most interestingly, I have the right to tell it to just shut up. Like literally one of my dearest friends uh, organizes, you know, she schedules time with her brain. Her brain would wake up in the morning and say, uh, you know, we have to solve this issue. Your boyfriend is doing this and that. And, and she will say, okay, I heard you. We're going to talk about this at six. Okay. And believe it or not, when you do that, your brain goes like, yeah, six is go. This is good. I'll, I'll do six. Six is fine. So, so that reminds me of something I've heard you say, Mo, um, about, well, a little bit about what, what is our little voice trying to protect us in some way and, and can we therefore see it in a slightly different way? But, but just firstly, I wanted to thank everyone who contributed by sharing so openly what's going on in your heads. And I wanted to tell you all that you are enough and you are good enough. And I did love seeing that some people also posted some of what you've just been modelling, Mo, people saying you're doing the best you can, people saying today's going to be a good day and actually just noticing how differently that feels when you're when your voice is saying some of those things to you but but is it true to say that to some extent yes it might come from an early influence like that that quote that says um the way we speak to our children becomes their inner voice always stays with me as a parent is the implication of that but aside from who else we might be hearing from our past is it true that our inner voice might be also protecting us from like looking stupid or taking a risk? Is there something about that? What, what's going, there, is there, there is a ton of truth. reason why it's doing this? So, so remember, you know, the happiness equation is at the core of what, why our brain causes us unhappiness, okay? Unhappiness or any kind of negativity. So any kind of negativity as per the happiness equation is a moment where events miss expectations. So, so you, you look at an event and you say, this event is not what I expect it to be. It's not what I want it to be, right? In that sense, your, your brain is actually doing you a big favor because in that sense, your brain is a, is a survival mechanism. It's screaming and engaging uh, hormonal changes in your body. It is, you know, engaging uh, emotions in you simply because it, it is saying, this is not my optimum state of survival. Right. So when you when you see it that way, it's amazing. It, you know, unhappiness. When I, I spoke to uh, my wonderful friend, Matthew Ricard, I'm sure I, I think you had him here on Action for Happiness. Amazing, amazing human being. And he's in, in the news. He is seen to be, um, uh, you know, the world happiest, happiest man is the headlines of the newspapers. And I asked him on my podcast and I said, uh, Matthew, are you you know, you're the world happiest man you know, rhetorical question really, but I was saying, are you always happy? And he laughs out loud in his very lovely French accent. And he says, I'm always pissed off. Right. And, and I, you know, and that's the truth. I, I spent wonderful time with his holiness, the Dalai Lama, again, who, people who, who practiced a, a lifetime hmm, of finding that calm and peace. 
And he openly tells you, of course, no. I mean, sometimes I'm angry at the killing. Sometimes I'm angry at, you know, the way the world turns and so on and so forth. But I learned to bring myself back to happiness. I learned to bring myself back to calm. So what does that mean? It means that when your brain is screaming like a fire alarm, okay, telling you that something is not meeting its expectations, you go through what I normally call the happiness flow chart, which was a big part that was noticed in that little voice in your head is the idea of the happiness flow chart, which is really three questions. Hmm? Your brain is screaming and saying, my boss hates me, he's gonna fire me, okay? You go through three questions. Question number one is, is it true? Does your boss hate you or love you? Or does he have any emotion about you at all? Or is he just your boss and bosses are annoying? Okay, uh, you know, that's number one. So if the question is, is it true is answered with a no, it's not true, then drop it, okay? If it is true, you ask question number two. And question number two is, what can I do to fix it? Right? Is there something I can do in the relationship with my boss that can improve that love bit between us, okay? If not, if, if the answer is yes, do it, okay? If the answer is no, then the third question, which is what can I do to make my life the best it can be despite its presence? The, 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 the presence of the lack of love that he shows to me, right? So, so basically I call that committed acceptance. Can I accept the fact that my boss doesn't like me, but make my performance amazing? Okay, so that he doesn't really, his liking to me doesn't make any difference. Or can I accept the fact that my boss doesn't like me and go find another job? Okay, and, and the reality is if we go through those, you know, three steps, it's three questions. Hmm? Is it true? Can I do something to fix it? Can I accept it and make my life better despite its presence? Most of the unhappiness goes away, right? So, so what's, what's happening here is I'm not saying your brain hates you. Your brain loves you. It's trying to keep you safe and in the optimum you know, space of success. But when you don't respond to it the proper way, the fire alarm keeps going. And the fire alarm literally is driving you crazy inside your head. And at the same time, if there is a fire, you're not doing anything about it. You're just complaining all the time. I, I really love this, man. I, I, the simplicity of those questions is really amazing but the the, 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 sec the, the the second and third ones in particular remind me that combination of you know um if you can change it or if not accept it reminds me of that what's called the serenity prayer that grant me the um exactly you know the, the what is it the ability to to change the things i can to accept the things and accept, i can't yeah. and the wisdom to know the difference um, yes that's, that's a really yeah. lovely practical way of absolutely managing yeah. that so uh, i also really love the idea that you can sort of say to your brain let's come back to that later I, I hear you you're feeling angry or frustrated or sad or unheard let's 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 address this at a later date i mean that's a really lovely example of a sort of practical tool or, or, or by the way like that that we can do in these situations or, or by the way, not address it at all. So, so some people, some people really, really, really struggle when I say this. Okay, but um, if a child falls in a well in Marrakesh, okay, and the BBC and the CNN and Fox News and every other news network chooses to uh, display that on screen all the time, okay, hurting my heart making me struggle, making me suffer, when I can do absolutely nothing about it, okay? From one side, there is a horrendous negativity bias or attention bias, I'm sorry to, to, to call it, uh, to, uh, you know, I meant attention bias, which basically means when they put the spotlight on it, you think that this tragedy is the only tragedy in the world, when in reality, you should wake up every morning with your heart praying for every child that's struggling. It's not that one child that they put the, spite, uh, the, the spotlight uh, light on that is the only one that's struggling. That's number one. And number two is why would I torture myself by watching the news every single day telling me negative things that I cannot change? Okay. There was a study done post 9-11 where there was a 70% surge in stress uh, because of CNN showing the Twin Towers being hit all the time. Now, you need to be informed. But how informed is informed and where is the cutoff point around things that you should just simply tell yourself, I pray for the, you know, uh, the, the salvation of everyone, but I can't do anything about it. I can't engage with this. Okay. I can't drain myself into this because I have better things to do to my loved ones, to my kids, to, to the world at large, by the way, huh? by, by being happy. It's, 
I, I, well, a lot of people, you know, forget this. Your happiness is not your privilege. Your happiness is your duty. You have a duty to be happy because when you're happy, you're nicer to your children. You're more productive at your work. You're more willing to, to have an open mind and listen to others and the difference in points of view. You are more contributing with compassion to everyone around you rather than hating and, and feeling angry about everyone around you. It's a very different state that is, believe it or not, a duty for everyone to reach. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you really look at it this way, suddenly you recognize that a lot of the madness that's going in there is not just what your mom told you when you were two. It's what you kept feeding afterwards when sometimes you don't need to be part of that at all. Mm. I, I very much agree with that, Mo. Um, just coming back to the, the very specific instance of your mind coming up with a, one of those examples that people kindly shared you know you're not good enough for example let's say you you can ask the question is it true and and it probably isn't true but you know my, it always, the brain it always the, isn't true always, by the way sorry it's all it's never true no indeed it but, really but let's isn't. say that somebody here in the audience or me at times we're stuck with the thought and however much we say that's not true or i don't want to think about that now i want to drop it it, it still stays. Do you, do you find there's any particular techniques, whether it's a breathing technique or getting outside into nature? Are there any ways that you can help sort of shift that sort of sense of overwhelm that sometimes we have? Yeah, yeah. So, so allow me to answer this on two levels. Level number one is just the, the statement of, is, am I, is anyone ever not good enough? Okay, I think that's a very important question because good enough for what? That's the whole point. Huh? If you ask me, am I good enough at basketball? No, I freaking suck. I'm short, I'm heavy, I have a little belly, I'm old, right? I, I suck at it. Hmm? So am I good enough at basketball? No. If I wanted to be good enough at basketball, I may want to go and exercise for 20 hours a day and become good at it. I'll be mediocre still, but better at it. And I will not write a single line, I will not record a single podcast, I will not, I will not, I will not, okay? So good enough for what is a very interesting mm -hmm. question. My lovely daughter uh, frequently tells me, you know, I have not advanced to where I want to be as quickly as I should. And I said, baby, do you realize the life you had to go through, losing your brother and your best friend when, you, when she was 20, and how that impacted your life and the, the, the work you had to do on yourself. So yes, you may not be good enough at being the first to, to graduate from university among your friends. You had to take a break when Ali left, right? But how much work, internal work, you may be much better than good enough on the internal work you've done on yourself. And I think people need to realize that. Every single human on earth is not good enough if you take certain topics and every single human on earth is more than amazing if you take other topics. Don't focus yourself on what's not good enough or the, the topics that you didn't cover because your neighbor covered them and forget the ones that you did cover or the points you from which you started. And, and so accordingly, stop being unkind to yourself. Understand that with the hand that you were dealt, you're more than good enough. That's number one. Number two, I have an exercise. You said, so how do I deal with this? Okay. I'm a very organized engineer, which sounds really strange in the topic of happiness, but I really am. Huh? So I have a bi-weekly, I, I don't call it a meditation, but it is really in, in, you know, in uh, being aware of what you're aware of is normally one of the advanced meditations. So I, I do a, 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 a 25 minute of something I call meet Becky. Okay, and meet Becky is an exercise where I don't attempt to calm my thoughts, you know, focusing on my breathing or whatever uh, I can focus on, but I attempt to let my thought go, my thoughts go, go free. Okay, so, so I would have two rules for the exercise. I set a timer to 25 minutes, put the timer away so that I don't look at the time. And then I do, I have two rules. Rule number one is every thought is acknowledged, okay, and dismissed. I keep a paper and a pen if I need to take note of it so that it leaves my brain. But every thought that comes up, I would simply say, uh, okay, brain, you think that, uh, you know, I I'm bold. Thank you for that. What else? Okay. And my brain would then say, don't forget to text Mark about A, B, and C. Excellent. Quick note, text Mark. And then, yes, you want me to text Mark. What else? So rule number one is acknowledge it and dismiss it. Rule number two is no thought can be repeated. 
Okay. So basically when your brain, when you, when you start listening to your mind, speaking to you, it starts to slow down because it wants to say something intelligent. Okay. And then very, very quickly, it really, really runs out of things. And so it brings the same thing up again. It would go again and say, oh, you're bold, you're whatever. Right. Right. And, and so I would say, but you told me that before what else and your brain will shut up completely. Normally, in my case, it takes 11 to 13 minutes. Now, the exercise, the, the, the remaining 12 minutes of the exercise, I, I promise you, is like being in heaven. I, I mean, those of us who meditate know the, the, the amazing feeling of calm that you can get when you focus on something other than thought. When you do meet Becky and your brain runs out of thought, it's effortless because your brain goes like, that's it. I have nothing else to say. And it completely shuts up, right? Heaven. Now, what I do afterwards is I take my notes, okay? And I take five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it takes. And I look at those notes and prioritize. If any of those thoughts is relevant, I bring it to the top, okay? And I act on it. I take it through the, you know, the three questions and I act on it. Now, right? If, so, if some of those thoughts are totally stupid, totally, totally irrelevant and stupid, I take a red pen and I visually strike them through. So that the next time they come up in my head, I go like, we said we're not going to talk about this again, right? And then in the middle, there is a set of thoughts that are relevant, but not that important. And I will have an agreement with my brain and say, until we finish the top 10, we're not going to talk about this, okay? And believe it or not, when you do, so I do this very frequently, two to three times a week. Huh? And when you do this regularly, suddenly that white noise in there starts to really get organized. Okay, so suddenly, if you keep thinking incessant thoughts, they will be about problem number one, which, by the way, it deserves that you give it the attention. Okay, maybe not incessantly. You, it's, you're much better off if you think deliberately, but even if you are, at least you're thinking about something that matters, something that you've verified is true and something that requires your work. Okay, so, so by, by letting your brain bring up things and listening and taking notes, and really reorganizing, you you get you end up in a much quieter place about those thoughts. Mo, um, we're getting questions in the Q and A, and I want to come on to them soon because there's so much wisdom in this community. But I'd love to just um, explore the idea of hope and optimism with you. I, I often talk about encouraging people to be a realistic optimist. You know, see life as it is, but try and focus on the constructive ways to respond. I know you've talked before about hope sometimes being a little bit a passive idea, and how we need to sort of make sure that we have a sort of uh, active relationship to the change that we'd like to see in the world around us. Do you want to say a little bit about optimism and hope? Yeah, I, it's, I, I don't understand how you can feel any other way. I, I know this will sound really strange. You, again, think like an organized engineer. There is one of two possibilities. Either life will go easy or life will go hard. Okay? Most of the time it will go a bit of both. Right? If it's going easy then amazing. We love life. It's wonderful. Okay. If it's going hard every single time life is hard to you, hmm, it's teaching you something that you would never give up on. So what I, in, if you remember in Soul for Happy, I had that eraser test where I told people, and I did it practically. I asked 20,000 people. Okay. Probably more. Huh? I said, pick an, a painful event in your life, an event that while you were going through it, hmm, you told yourself, I wish this was not happening. Okay, then imagine if I gave you a technology to erase that event from, from, uh, from space time. Okay, not the memory of it, erase the entire event and accordingly erase everything that happened as a result. Right. So, you know, j just like a funny example, when you and I met the first time, remember we met in a train station. Okay, it was so confusing for me and wasn't a pleasant experience to find you. Right. If I erased that event because it was unpleasant, I would erase meeting you. Okay. And then I would erase the encouragement you gave me. And then I would erase the contacts I had with others and so on and so forth. Right. When you, when you tell people that, and you tell them by removing the harshness of, from, from your past, you will lose everything that you've become as a result. Most people, most people in my study around 98, 99% will say, no, I'll keep it. Even though it felt really bad then, it feels amazing that I am who I am now. So the other side of this, either life is kind to you or life is harsh to you because you're learning something that's gonna make you better, okay? Mm. If this has always been the case, 100% of your life, it's either good 
or making you better, then why is it not going to be the same way in the future? So I'll tell you what's going to happen in my next month, okay? With, with absolute certainty, people can text me after a month and tell me if this happened or not. There will be awesome moments where I will have wonderful connections to humans and there will be hardships and difficult times that will happen in my life, okay? Both of those are true. This is what life is. And eventually, at the end of it, at the end of the month, I'll be doing okay Hmm? unless I leave the world. But otherwise, if I'm still in the world, I'll be doing okay. I'll be learning and developing and I will have developed wonderful experiences and wonderful connections, okay? And you know what's going to happen the next month? Exactly the same. Hmm. And what's going to happen the following month? Exactly the same. Yeah. So how can you not be optimistic? What we are worried about is something really interesting that the highlight of this world that we live in is anxiety, okay? Is anxiety that I will not be good enough to deal with the harshness when it shows up. When every harshness that showed up in your life so far, you've been able to deal with. And I don't know where we get that from. Yes, it's not gonna be pleasant, but you're gonna deal with it. So why not be optimistic? So one um, challenge to that for all of us who care deeply about human happiness is when we think beyond ourselves, and you know, Mo, that this community is people who want to create a happier world. And we look around us and we see people that are not only struggling with anxiety and loneliness and personal issues, but we see perhaps what we might consider to be existential problems, climate change, biodiversity uh, issues, you know, war, you know, all kinds of things that are undermining our collective well-being. So obviously I try to approach that, as you've just discussed, in it with a sense of optimism and hope and learning, but it can feel really overwhelming. So how do yeah. we bring that sort of, yeah, I guess, a active hope into a, a difficult and sometimes rather broken world? Can, can, I, can I do something to fix it? Question number two. I mean, you know that uh, I'm dedicating 70% of my effort this year to artificial intelligence and my second, my second book, which was called Scary Smart, uh, you know, sort of warning the world about the potential risks of artificial intelligence, right? And I, have, I am a prominent figure in artificial intelligence because of the work I've done uh, in Google X for a very long time. Hmm? So I'm doing the best that I can to make the world aware. I'm doing the best that I can to take action, okay? But I can't fix it. Can I do something to fix it? The answer to question number two is not. I can try to do things to fix it, but I'm not sure I can. So what can I do to make the lives of those I care about better despite its presence? So when I'm, when I'm speaking about AI and the challenges that we may get from AI, I remind people that this is an opportunity to remember that you're here now, that to, to upskill, to connect to your children, to do this, to do that, so that your life is the best that can be despite the things that are out of your control, okay? Surprise, surprise, humanity forgets hmm, in the age of the revolu progress revolution that we've created that we're always out of control. Okay, we always restore control, but humanity, when created in the caveman and woman years, okay, we're always out of control. We were, we were always in threats. We were always, you know, hunting. We were always trying to find food. We were always trying to find shelter, and we survived. We did reasonably well. We had, we were happier then that than we are happier now. Okay, the trick is this. I, I, I said it when when I spoke about the harshness of life. It's not going to be pleasant but it's going to be fine. Hmm? And video gamers like me actually really enjoy it when the game is not pleasant. When the game is too pleasant, it's very boring. It's like, I don't know, Sims or like, uh, we're gonna move a character around and pet a, a cat for a while. That's not a real game. A real game has to be challenging, okay? The fun of gaming, and, and I know this is really the Jedi master level of happiness. But all of the true practitioners, the top, top people, hmm? you talk to the Sadhgurus, the, you know, the Dalai Lama, the, the monks and, and, and teachers of the world, they're little kids. They're happy as a child, okay? They're playing, they're engaged in the game. They understand the difficulties and the challenges, hmm? but they see it for what it is. It is a game that will come with challenges that you are going to overcome, Okay, or you're going to die and it's game over. And then we worry about the next game. As long as I'm alive, I'm fully in this one. Okay, I'm telling my brain to fully flow with this game. 
to fully enjoy every bit of it, including the hardship. Because you know what? I'm a much better gamer because of the hardship of the last few games than I was when I started gaming. And that's the that's the trick. The trick is flow with it, enjoy it in despite its it, it's it's it it not being pleasant. I love the idea of flowing with it. And I heard you talking about that today, actually, having just come back from a retreat. But I, I wonder, and this is a challenging question, I think, for all of us that I would classify as to some extent rather privileged. So you and I um both have a luxury of being in a warm, safe place. We've probably eaten today. Many of those wonderful gurus you've mentioned probably also have enough to eat. They're probably not in yeah. major trauma. Um, Karen has an interesting question coming to the Q&A. She says, you talk about how happiness is how we're born in our default state, but what about when our basic needs aren't met, when we're isolated, when we're in poor health, we're suffering financially or even unable to feed ourselves or our family? How can we be happy then? I think that's a great question. Right. I think the reality is, um, uh, um, I don't know how to say that diplomatically, so I'm going to say it as it is. If if Karen is writing this question, looking at a computer screen or a phone screen from a safe place where she's not human trafficked, she's not starving to death, she's not freezing in cold, she's not, uh, uh, you know, she has a, a roof on top of her shelter, of her a shelter on top of her head. She life might not be easy, okay? But there must be some can, something like a billion people that are less privileged than that, okay? Probably if my calculations are correct, anyone on this call is more privileged than at least two to three billion people on the planet who have nothing at all, okay? And now it becomes a question of asking ourselves, where are we exactly? Because define basic needs. Define basic needs. I dated uh, a wonderful woman at a point in my life that told me, and I quote, hmm? she said, Mo, you have no idea how poor I am when she unlocked her SUV and put her iPhone on the dashboard. California lifestyle. Okay. I'm not saying she's, uh, you know, that this is right, but in reality, her perception of what basic needs are is very different than a perception of an African person on, of what basic needs are. Now, let me go back and, uh, you know, after being a little too direct, say, but yes, every one of us comes with harshness in life, okay? I, I always tell myself, hmm, if I had lost all, everything I've ever made, hmm, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have blinked as compared to losing Ali. Every one of us gets a test in life, okay? That is the exact thing we need to develop on. Right. If 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 life wanted to develop me and get me into my happiness work and put me in front of you and get me to think deeper and and, and write and so on, it it couldn't have done that by by taking all my money. OK, by the way, as I always say, I, I eventually decided that money wasn't important, gave most of it away. But the reality is I never really was into it anyway. So that wasn't my test. My test was Ali. Okay, I say that even publicly as well. Even if Aya had left, Aya is a very adventurous soul. Huh? She jumps out of aeroplanes and she does, you know, uh, wanted to learn snowboarding and so on and so forth. It would have made a tiny bit more sense. It's Ali, that little Zen monk sitting in nowhere. When he leaves, that the test becomes really harsh. Okay, all of a sudden, due to human error. Now, I'm not asking for sympathy here. I'm trying to say every one of us is missing a few things and has a few things, okay? And when we define what basic needs are, we have one of two things to do. We have, we have, we have two, th no, not one of, we have two things to do. One is to be grateful as we look down to all of those that, that may not have what we have and hopefully have the compassion in our heart to be kind and generous to them, okay? And then the second is to look up and say, and what can I do to fix it? What can I do to enjoy my life and the life of those I love? despite its presence, okay? The, 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 the fact that life has been unfair to you, okay, is not an excuse to not strive for happiness, right? You may not achieve total happiness, hmm? uh, but you can get better. And, and the studies will tell you that money and all of the things that we talk about just to that we define basic needs is to get to the average income of the country you live in for, for people who want to reflect on this. Okay, if you get to the average income of the of the country you live in, 
uh, beyond that, your happiness plateaus. You don't become happier with more needs met. Okay, because what you get after that, as my, uh, you know, founders of Google, which I worked with in my life, once said, you just get to buy more toys. It doesn't really make a lot of difference to your life. So, so I, I know this was a harsh answer, but first of all, remember how privileged you are compared to others. Have the love and compassion for them to wish them well or help them. Okay. And then try to get yourself where you want to be rather than sit down and say, life is unfair to me. Because sitting down to say, life is unfair to me is not going to make things better. It's just going to make you miserable. Mo, the most upvoted question in the list today is actually an interesting one that draws on a few things you said, but it's about the kind of global cultural context for happiness. So Charlie's given an example that America is, you know, obsessed with happiness, but very, often very unhappy, whereas Finns in Finland, you know, don't really emphasize the search for happiness. It's more of a sort of contentedness and, a, uh, and, and yet Finland is topping the, the world happiness rankings, um, much to the surprise of some Finns, interestingly. Um, so Charlie's question was, what can the Americans learn from other cultures about happiness? But I guess, you know, you're a very well-traveled man. You've looked at this through different angles. You know, what, what will be your sense of the cultural context when it comes to happiness and the pursuit of happiness? So, so let's add another another country to, uh, you know, the West, let's call it. The West is one category. Uh, Finland and Scandinavia is another category. And let's add Africa or Latin America as the third category. The difference between them is uh, America, for example, has almost everything. A lot of people have a lot of things, okay, uh, compared to the rest of the world. But happiness is harder to come by. Uh, Finland, actually... Uh, and Scandinavia, the reason they have the right to be happier is because of something called the subjective well-being index that the government measures, where the government actually makes sure that they provide every citizen's basic needs, going back to your default state. Huh? So they'll give you food, shelter, uh, you know, uh, welfare if you're not working, uh, you know, whatever, medical care and so on. All of that is provided. So by definition, they're saying we removed the basic reasons for you to be unhappy. You can choose to be happy. Okay. But interestingly, some of those countries still have a very high suicide rate. So people still actually feel unhappy as evident by the suicide. Uh, the third is Latin America where people have nothing at all, okay? But they're dancing and having the time of their life. So in, interesting, huh? that, that's, that, the, the, that triangle. The, the, the differences are found in a very simple secret, huh? which is happiness is not about getting what you want. It's about enjoying what you have, right? And, and that's the whole idea. The whole idea is if you don't, if you don't enjoy, if you have a lot, hmm, you tend to want more. You tend to compare to others. Like, you know, in, in America or in, you know, in the West in general or in Finland, you sort of, as you're given more, your expectations rise accordingly. Okay. You sort of like s sign a, an imaginary service level agreement with life. It's like, if you give me welfare and medical coverage and so on and so forth, then why are you not, not making my girlfriend nicer? Okay. Isn't that part of the service level agreement? We humans will always rise one step above what we're getting and say, why is that missing? Why is that missing? Why is that missing? The happiest people in the world question a very interesting question. Why am I blessed with this? It's not what am I missing in my life? What, what have I done to deserve what I have? What have I done uh, to deserve getting Ali? Do, do you understand that? Hmm? Most people will look at Ali dying and saying, why did life single me out and take my child? Okay, I never planned for Ali. We didn't expect Ali to come. Hmm? And when I think, when my brain tells me Ali died, I tell my brain, Ali lived. Do you understand that? Ali spent 21 and a half glorious years with me hmm? that I did not earn, I did not deserve, I did not do anything to qualify me. I was a grumpy piece of shit, okay? And yet life blessed me with an incredible gift. And I can remember that. And so that's why when he leaves our world, I can say, still a fair deal still a wonderful deal. A much worse deal would, would have been that he wouldn't come in the first place. Did you understand that? 
And I think the reality of the matter is that the happiest societies on earth are those that take whatever is given to them and say, it's beautiful. So I can enjoy this, okay? It's hard, it's tough, hmm? but I can enjoy that too, okay? And yes, sometimes most people remember, forget this, by the way, again, to, to the first question. The biggest challenge with not having your basic needs met hmm, is in Western societies. It's not in, in Eastern or Latin or African societies. In Eastern and Latin and African societies, those communities hold on together, okay? So in a, in a way, when you really don't have your basic needs met, your cousin will walk in and say, hey, come for dinner, okay? Or your, your best friend will say, hey, how are you? Just connecting, huh? It's in the West, we replace that with the government and welfare and, and the internet and so on and so forth. And that's really, it's not, it's, it's, the, the world is not supposed to have anyone's basic needs unmet. Statistically accurate, huh? There are 2 billion people in the world that are undernourished, and 2 billion people in the world that are overweight and obese. Think about it. Huh? Life provides for all 8 billion. We just distribute it wrong. And the ones that are overweight and obese are still unhappy. They're still looking at that next meal and saying, why don't I have that? Mm -hmm. Happiness is found in enjoying what you have. Mo, I, I had a shiver down my spine as you said that particular observation about Ali died actually Ali lived and this, Ali lived. that, that, that yeah, reframing and I you know I might think about I'm having a difficult time with one of my children but I have a child that I have a otherwise Absolutely. loving relationship my my parents might be getting old and unwell recently and yet they have had wonderful lives and we still have a wonderful relationship I, I for every you. one of those darknesses there's a, a yeah a, an awakening of like there's a there's something amazing to be grateful for here and appreciate oh that I often God. take for granted I swear to you, every time you feel something is wrong, just look at them and say, oh my God, I got another day. Mm. I got another day. That's it, okay? By the way, don't expect a million more days. Nobody knows where you're going to be next week, right? I got another day. That's such a blessing, such a gift. Mm. It really is, Mo, and this has been a real blessing and a gift spending this time with you. I know it's really late. Um, yeah, it's getting into the early hours where you are now. So we're so grateful for this time. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, I just wanted to revisit a point that a few people have raised in the questions about, uh, you know, when somebody feels like, you, to answer your third question, can I just accept it? People are sort of resisting that acceptance. And I'd imagine, you know, if I did lose a child, I might resist, you know, the fact that, that how can I possibly move on? And Kiara said, what if we can't accept it? I was recently hit by a new disability and I can't for the life of me see a way out of it or accept that this is who I am now. And I think in some ways that's a, it's an understandable uh, response really to a sorry. recent really trauma. Sorry, but it, yeah. yeah, is it something that time helps with and that you heal over time or we can change how we refrain things as with the passage of time? No, no, I feel the same pain like the day he left. No, mm. okay. Uh, it's just that, I, I don't know how to say this, Kiara, I, and I am really sorry that you have to struggle with this, but unhappiness is not going to fix it. It's adding insult to injury. It's rubbing salt in the wound. Okay? And 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 that, that to me, and I know it sounds really weird, but that to me is what gets me out of bed every day, hmm? is, that, is the fact that I know in my mind that if I had hit my head against the wall 700 times a day, until the day I'm on my deathbed, 27 years later, Ali would still not be back. I would not be able to bring him back. So what's the point? Why would I do this? Why would I make myself miserable? Why would I make everyone in my, in my family and loved ones miserable? Why would I destroy the world around me? Why don't I take whatever happened and accept it, not from a position of weakness, but from a position of strength? Strengths, the strong people, Stoics will tell you, are the ones that will look at life as it is, okay? They're, they're, you look at life and say, yeah, that sucks, but it's my new reality, okay? And if it's my new reality, how can I make it the absolute best reality I can make it, okay? I, you know, I, 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 some of you may have seen on my Instagram account, I was detained, and it's not a comparison to being, uh, you know, disabled in any way, but I was detained in a U.S. facility because I was not allowed into LA airport because I had a wrong, a wrong visa type. 
So they kept me in a, in a, in a, a facility, really like a criminal, for 34 hours, right? And in my mind, I could have dwelled on, but I'm a good human. I've done nothing wrong. Even my the immigration officer that told me that you know my visa type was not was wrong took nine hours to find that fact. Okay, so they had to research and research and research, and then he said, "Oh, you needed this visa type for that activity." And I said, "Did you know that?" And he said, "No." And I said, "How should could I have if it took you, the expert, nine hours to know it?" And I could have dwelled on this for thirty four hours, or I could have sat down and said, "Oh my God, silent retreat." Okay, I, I swear to you, I was over the moon in silence for 34 hours, right? And I know that's not something that everyone enjoys, but there is beauty in every pain. There is something wonderful in every gift that we're given, okay? Sweet and sour is not delicious because of the sweet only. And, and it's, it's drilling deep and telling ourselves, this is my life as it is. How am I going to make it amazing? Because making it miserable is not going to fix it in any way. It's not going to improve it at all. This is my life as it is. How can I make it amazing? I think that's a wonderful thought to leave us with today, Mo. Um, it's, as ever, just a mind-blowing experience talking to you because you see life in a particular way and you're able to convey that it, with such grace and such insight. And I've sensed a lot of gratitude for you already in the chat. And I'm so pleased that so many of us have been able to take part in this together today. Uh, thank you everyone for being here for this live event, for your great questions, for the lovely support and um, interesting discussion in the chat. And Mo, keep up the inspiring work. Um, we'll be sharing a link tomorrow to this video, uh, to your amazing podcast, Slow Mo, which I've had the pleasure of appearing on. And you've had so many yeah. amazing great session yeah. and to your to your little voice in the head book i know you've got new work coming out next year so maybe we could do this again sometime soon and share your always latest. my honor yeah mark thank you so much for the opportunity thank you all for the wonderful and kind comments and yeah it's always a pleasure let's create a happier and kinder world together and let's remember that life may not be perfect but we can uh, we can still make it wonderful thanks man thank you